Hello, I'm Adam. And I'm Adrian. And welcome to Cast from the Crypt. Today, today we talk about X. I have had so many people tell me, I can't believe you haven't seen this movie. I can't believe you haven't seen this movie. Uh, Because it seems like something just up my alley, right? A new slasher. Uh, Not, I guess that new now, it's almost a year old, but... Uh, yeah. yeah, I finally got around to watching it. I really enjoyed it. How about you? Yeah, I also heard a lot of hype about this movie. Um, I watched it a little earlier than you did and then got to revisit it. And I like this movie. I do. Um, but I think maybe uh, it got too hyped up for me. I, I can kind of agree with that. Yeah. But that's kind of happened a lot to me in... The year of 2022, I had too many horror movies overhyped for me. Me too. So yeah. I kind of had tempered my expectation before I watched this, and it was pretty much what I expected. It's pretty good. Yeah, I agree. I That's exactly what I would say. I'm really, really impressed with the production team behind this movie, though. Ty West is the director. I'm not really familiar with any of his other work, though I do know that he... He's directed several horror films before this. I, I'm a little um, bit familiar. I've seen um, House of the Devil a while ago. Oh, okay. Okay. Was it good? Yeah, I mean, like, for a horror movie, you know, especially for, like, a new horror movie director, like, mm-hmm. it's pretty solid. It's not, okay. like, crazy. I don't think it really compares to this, but uh, yeah. it, it makes sense that this is the progression of yeah. his, like, craft I I just find their like will to work on this franchise because it is becoming a franchise now. Yeah, very impressive. Yeah. You know, they were making this movie, and I think the story goes that uh, Mia Goth or Ty West or both of them were like, "Wouldn't it be crazy if we made like a prequel?" And they started working on the prequel right after this movie was finished. So they've basically, uh, and my understanding is they've been working on the the third movie since they finished Pearl. Um, and I think stuff like that's really fun. Like, I, I dig that, and I know it was really well-received at South by Southwest, and it's very clearly an homage to slashers like Texas Chainsaw. And for all those reasons, I can really appreciate this movie. And I do think it's a fun watch overall. Yeah, I'm, yeah I was also pretty impressed that I mean, I, I was told to watch X so many times, and then Pearl came out in the very same year, and I had a million people telling me to go watch Pearl. To my understanding, Pearl is just as well-received, and and I think it's really cool that they're taking these characters this far, and it feels like because they're making these movies in such rapid succession that it's like this, this train that they're on, and they're not wanting it to slow down. You know, like, while they're on a roll, they, they're keeping it going, and I like that. I, I like that they're expanding on these characters, because they're not... This isn't a traditional sort of slasher villain. It, it wouldn't lend itself to a traditional slasher franchise, but I do like that they are taking the characters further than just one movie. Well, and I just enjoy that this is not your run-of-the-mill, high-budget horror film right this is i mean they did have a budget of one million dollars but today um especially with distribution by a24 who is huge now that's not that much money um behind a project especially one that is now going that is now spawning actively spawning uh sequels successful sequels too and um it it is I did say that, you know, and I think you agree, like, it is what you expect, but it's also unique uh, because it isn't like every other slasher. There isn't really, in my opinion, uh, this franchise, I don't find Pearl to be as iconic as all these other slashers. Like, I don't think they're trying to do what what was that movie we hate? The Clown. Oh, Terrifier? I don't yeah, I don't think they're trying to do what Terrifier tried to do with Art the Clown. 
I don't think they're swinging for the fences here, hoping that Pearl is a household name. Because a lot of the horror just lies in the, the setting, you know, the isolation, the understanding that what these people are doing is, is kind of wrong, or, you know, at least in the eyes of society at that time. And so there's a lot here. I, I don't think Pearl is, is the scary thing, right? I didn't watch the movie for the old lady um, or the old couple killing people. It, it kept me entertained and they were an added bonus. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Uh, and if, if the movie was just that, just, oh, be afraid of these are the villains, then yeah, I don't think it would be as good because yeah. they don't actually start doing uh, the slashing until like halfway through the movie. And the movie is like an hour and 40 something minutes. Yeah, I, I completely agree. That is one of the chief complaints. I, I have a hard time saying complaint because, again, I, I do enjoy this movie. Um, I, I did find that it took a while to get get there fortunately i quite like the characters in this movie uh, mia goth plays a character named maxine uh, or max is what she goes by she also plays pearl the old woman in really really robust aged ma aging makeup which yeah. until just before we started recording you had no idea yeah i did not know i throughout the entire movie i kept thinking man they really cast this old woman well because she looks like if uh maxine was old if she was like 90 years old <laughs> come to find out that's so funny it is the same woman yeah uh, which wow this is not a movie i would have expected to have had any sort of robust makeup or effects team but wow was this convincing mm -hmm. i did yeah. not at all know this wasn't a 93 year old woman See, and I did. I, I knew early on that Mia Goth played both roles. And I do think that kind of hampered my my enjoyment of it just a little bit. Because I was then looking for flaws in the makeup. So you know? wait, I, you I, say I, you knew, like, you did you know beforehand or did you, like, realize? I did, I did know. Okay. No, no, I did not realize while watching. I had, I had been told beforehand that she played both. And so I was looking for flaws in the makeup, right? Maybe had I not known, that wouldn't have happened. Because it is it is quite good. I agree. Um, but I find Mia Goth's performance as both of these characters to be... You know, her performance as, as Maxine is serviceable. Like, she's good. Um, but her performance as Pearl is really, really quite good. Because it's, it is effective. And, you know, you're a testament to that. You, you had no idea, which I think is awesome. Um, for me, the standouts for me were Kid Cudi, <laughs> and <laughs> I, I'm being dead serious. Kid Cudi and Britney Snow, I really liked them in this movie. Um, Britney Snow plays a porn star named Bar Bobby Lynn Parker, and Kid Cudi plays a porn star named Jackson Hole. <laughs> and <laughs> um, I thought they were good. Jenna Ortega was also really good. Um, I think her character's name is Lorraine. Um, there, there's some really good like ensemble stuff happening in this movie, and that's why I think, um, I was actually pretty entertained despite there not being a whole lot of action until the last quarter of the film. Yeah, the acting all around in this movie is pretty impressive. It's kind of like you know, for a movie of this type, it's kind of got some big casting choices, if you know what I mean. But they all did really good. I like these characters too. I like this group. It felt like there wasn't uh, too many people. Because, you know, in a slasher, the group of young people show up and then they get picked off. And a lot of times they're just there to be fodder. But every yeah. character here feels like they have a purpose and has a good bit of dialogue. You get insight into their character. And they feel a little more realistic than just like, uh, you know, the pretty girl who gets killed first and then the innocent one that is the final girl and yada 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 it's a little bit better than most typical slasher movies and it's kind of subversive too like 
like I just said, the cl the classic setup is there's like one couple, the guy's a jerk, the girl's hot, and she's just kind of pretty girl, and they have sex at one point and then get killed. This movie, every single character has sex or wants to have sex at this point because they are making porn. And instead of the innocent one, you know, the young little innocent girl surviving, it's one of these porn stars who's addicted to coke and is like arguably the most traditionally corrupted characters yeah. you could say like morally you know at least in the eyes of society morally corrupted characters that's who the final girl is and i very much appreciate that it feels very intentional it, it does is, this yeah. movie's beautifully subversive and I, I think that's why it's so entertaining well and we can get into the the plot here in just a moment but um you know one of the things I completely agree. It did feel subversive with that. But even the, you know, pearl clutching character played by Jenna Ortega here, you know, young, kind of skeptical of the environment that she's found herself in. She has nothing to do with the project other than her boyfriend being the cinematographer, <laughs> um, the cameraman. She ends up wanting to kind of jump into this world too, mid movie. And I dug that. I dug that because now all of the people that we are basically forced to root for are these porn stars or, uh, you know, these horn dogs. It's an unlikely crew to have to root for in a movie. And there's all sorts of imagery throughout the film about you know, Christianity and like puritanical views or uh, I should say evangelical views is what I meant. And I, I did like that part of it. Even the setting feels very intentional because yeah, they're going for, you know, a quaint Texas farm out in the middle of nowhere, but it's a Texas farm, in the seventies out in the middle of nowhere. Um, all the implications of this group of people being stuck in this specific place and time. Uh, I really, really dug that. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of really interesting stuff happening in this movie. Yeah, I, I don't think it's coincidence that the house looks very similar to the Texas Chainsaw House, too. Right, yeah. Yeah, I noticed that as well. Uh, the whole plot of land, it, it felt like it was from the Texas Chainsaw remake. Like, I, I felt like they just used the set. Yeah, definitely. There's... A lot of intention behind the choices this movie makes. You know, it, most slashers, a lot of slasher franchises, are very haphazard. Are very like, we're making a cheap slasher where someone gets chopped up. Um, some things don't have to be deep. You know, but this movie feels intentional with every shot and every line of dialogue and the setting. And I appreciate that. I think that's yeah. what makes it stand out. Um and even the villain, the main antagonist, this old woman named Pearl, she's not just crazy person goes on a killing spree. You know, she has depth. We spend so much time uh, just watching her, kind of getting to know her, before she even does anything. Like I say, halfway through the movie is when the slashing starts. And we see her do stuff, behave certain way. You get a sense of, like, what she wants before she starts killing anyone. Um, in most slasher movies, like, they find a crazy person, they start killing, and then maybe later on, uh, throughout the, at, towards the end of the movie, they find out why they're crazy and killing someone. Or they just don't. They're just a monster. And here, the opposite kind of happens. We get a character, and then we find out that she is much more nefarious than you think. Mm -hmm. um, in the universe of this movie, she is subversive to the other characters because they don't assume an old woman like this is capable of anything at all. First of all, not capable of having similar desires as like a young person would. You know, They don't at all assume she seeks sexual gratification. And... It seems like all of her frustration and her sadistic, maniacal intent, <laughs> I'll say, 
that stems from her being sexually repressed and not being able to express her sexuality in the same way she once was when she was younger. We find out that she is basically an old version of Maxine, uh, which, you know, both in the universe and literally it's the same actress. Uh, and in Pearl, where it, we flash back to when she's younger, it's still Mac, uh, Mia Goth, the same actress. Yeah, she wants to be young again. She sees herself as Maxine. Uh, she even says, like, Maxine is different. She's especially special because she relates to her so much. And none of these characters, and I guess, like, broadly, uh, general audiences would not assume that an old woman like this has any idea, any thought of sexual expression. Uh, but she's still a human person. She was young at one point, and in this universe was... Similarly, in the sex industry, like these characters. We've kind of danced around it. Do you want to talk about the plot just a little more thoroughly? Yeah. So uh, the setup for this film, right, it's, <laughs> it is the 70s, and it is obvious, right? As soon as the movie opens, the costumes, the music, just the way that the characters are interacting with each other, it is very 1979, and I loved it. Uh, but we have this motley crew on a road trip through what I'm going to guess is like central Texas, just from the, the looks of it. But the main characters really are Wayne Gilroy. He is this older porn producer. You get the sense that he's been working for a long time. And Maxine, the star of this, hopefully huge porn movie that's being made specifically for uh, a theater release, because that was really big in the 70s. Um, this is his girlfriend, right? And it's an interesting dynamic, because she is very much younger than him, very clearly. And, you know, he's he's got money. Um, so at the very beginning of this movie, we are asking questions about exploitation and uh, power dynamics, uh, but you also have some characters that are just seemingly simple people, but, you know, also porn actors, but you've got Kid Cudi playing Jackson Hole, you've got Bobby Lynn Parker played by Brittany Snow, and they are just making their way to this house that they have rented, I believe, and they have not let the owners know that they are going to be filming their porn movie there. There's also two characters, one named RJ. He is a amateur cameraman, uh, is very ambitious and is a huge movie fan. And he is insistent that this is going to be more than just porn. That's kind of his whole thing throughout the movie. Um, he is bringing his girlfriend along, Lorraine, played by Jenna Ortega. And she's this mousy young character very clearly the youngest one there and i really enjoy the setup you know immediately we kind of get a sense of the dynamics in this group an excellent example of telling me everything you can without clunky expositional writing just in the first 10 to 15 minutes of this movie um a lot of really good visual storytelling here too yeah uh so the movie begins in Houston, and they all live in Houston, and they travel from there to this place. I assumed it was just kind of, like, outside of Houston and still kind of coastal Texas because they have an alligator. Well, they uh, do have an alligator. <laughs> we, I guess, can get into that, but okay. Are you ready for my, like, ridiculous nitpick? Oh, I yes, mean, I am. This is, like, a microscopic, like, I'm getting I'm excited. into the minutia. They have a cellar, but if it was mm. if it's coastal Texas, as we know, uh, you can't have a cellar if you're below sea level or at sea level. And if there's an alligator, that implies they're on the coast. So, what they if <laughs> they couldn't have a? What if? Okay, okay, that's a good nitpick. <laughs> that's very solid. What if they are more central or north central? And we find out, like in Pearl, which neither of us have seen, right? No, I've not seen. 
Okay, maybe maybe we find out that they put the gator there. I would love to see that. <laughs> I, I don't know. You I know? don't know. I feel like I've driven past this house though. You know. Yeah, that's just, true. like near Sealy, just outside of the city. Yeah, you're right. It does kind of feel. It feels very close. Yeah, a little dumb nitpick. But they're going to this Sealy farmhouse with a cellar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they get there, and this old man pulls a shotgun on them, thinks he's from the county, you know, and it's, it's, it's just like this really paranoid old couple. Classic kind of, okay, red flags are going off. But they get into this guest house and they start filming their porn and that's the movie. Um, that's the start, that's the premise. And throughout the movie as they're doing stuff, this old woman, who we find out later is named Pearl, is watching them somewhat voyeuristically. Right when they get there, and they're unpacking and going into this guest house, uh, Maxine notices up in a window is Pearl looking down and just, once again, voyeuristically, just watching them. And then as the movie continues, uh, she becomes more and more voyeuristic. She uh, watches Maxine get naked and swim in the pond. Then she is watching the porn being filmed. And they're all under the assumption that they don't know that porn's being filmed. And I don't think her husband ever even finds out. But, like, she goes out of her way to watch it secretly. And she doesn't tell anyone. She doesn't tell her husband about it. Yeah, and this is the beginning of our, the audience's increasing understanding of this character's motives. Or, you know, rather her innermost desires that later do become motives because she does kind of take out her frustration on each of these characters, her sexual frustration on each of these characters. Then we get uh, probably one of the more uncomfortable sequences of this movie where Pearl pleads with her husband. We've maybe mentioned for a second, but there is a man in elderly makeup as well. Her husband's name is Howard. Uh, all I know is that the actor that plays Howard is named Stephen Ur or Yuri? Ure. Yeah, Yuri, maybe. I I don't quite know how to say his name. He is also in age makeup, and Howard just refuses to have sex with Pearl. You know, he says that it's because his heart can't handle it anymore, but you get the sense that this has been happening for, for some time, right? Uh, but I believe... Again, <laughs> oh, I believe his it too. heart I mean, hasn't been working for a while they it, look old and crusty well very quickly like he's showing them to the house and he has to stop because his chest hurts so like right yeah. off the bat we're oh he has heart problems and then this adds to her sexual frustration like she literally can't have sex with her husband and so i don't know it's a nice detail i believe him <laughs> when he says his heart can't take it yeah, they look super gross. I mean, they did such a good job. Howard especially is kind of goblin-y. Yeah, like, I, I think Pearl looks like, you know, she's fine. She's like, you know, a 93-year-old woman. Howard, though, yeah, is like, he has this balding head that's like black on top because the yeah. blood is not flowing there and he's he's ghoulish. Yeah. Yeah, very ghoulish. I love it. I love the design of, of both of those characters. But so we're left with that, right? That Pearl can't get her fix. You know, she just watched these young people and, and, and discovered what they are up to. And, uh, you know, that's kind of the, the opening setup, really. But they, they start filming the porn in various places. I want to briefly touch on some of the characters, though, and then we can kind of get into the climax. Sure. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, okay. Unintended. <laughs> uh so rj is a character i want to touch on he's this amateur filmmaker he's basically just the cameraman but is given a little more attaboy uh and he's technically the director while wayne gilroy is the executive producer but you very much get the sense that wayne gilroy has brought all these people together is making the film, is making it happen, and simply hired RJ as one of the many 
cogs in this machine he's making. The other mm. porn actors already know him. Uh, he says, my about to be fiance. So he's about to be engaged to Maxine. He's been in the industry. He's older. He's like in his 40s. I think he says he's 42 at some point. He's sure of himself. He knows what he's doing. RJ is newly a director, does not quite seem to be jiving with what they're doing with making porn because he says he's directing a movie he wants it to be avant-garde he says at one point like he has very big delusions and that is kind of a theme in this movie you know uh, maxine does coke every so often and keeps saying i'm gonna be a big star they play uh act naturally at one point when there's a line in in that song where she says you know i'm gonna be a big star like this is a a recurring theme is that you're on top of the world when you're young and then you age pearl keep saying you're just like me you're not going to be a big star like towards the end of the movie and it's all going wrong because these people's expectations are really diluted and unrealistic rj starts having strife with the other people making this film because they're not making an avant-garde movie they're making porn uh, his girlfriend, finally, her being the kind of innocent one, eventually seems to start to understand or at least wants to understand um, about the porn industry. And she says she wants to be in the movie. And this upsets RJ, her boyfriend. Understandably so, maybe. But he says the reason he doesn't want her to do it is because they're halfway through the film. The film is already being made. The script was already written. And her suddenly being included is going to derail everything. He, in his mind, has a movie planned out. And she says people are here to see TNA. It's a porno. It's not deep. And that's what seems to upset him. And maybe it is that his girlfriend's going to have sex with another guy. But he never says that. His complaint... Well... He does at one point say, you're not like these people, if you remember. And then that does kind of cause it is it is seemingly hypocritical, at least for a moment, because he says something along the lines of you're not like these people. And what is the implication there? So does he really not think that porn is capable of of being high art? Because uh, I think he even has an exchange with Brittany Snow's character about it. She yells at him, like, what do you mean? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, what are you people supposed to mean? But even that is kind of like he's, he sees himself as above the rest of them. When yes. he yeah. is literally never directed a thing in his life, no, he's not making an avant-garde film, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and his girlfriend, I guess, is just more realistic than him. I think she's realistic and there's an allure to this. Yes, and, and that upsets uh, him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, but there's um, a few lines that RJ says. Oh, there's one line. Um, Lorraine, his girlfriend, keeps saying, why do you want to be in this movie? Why do you want to do this? Why are we doing this? And he says, because it is possible to make a good, dirty movie. Um, for To me, this kind of felt a little fourth wall breaking in a way. Like maybe this is <laughs> the movie's way of saying you can make a good, dirty movie. Uh, maybe this movie is that good, dirty movie. What do you think? Ooh, I like that. I like to imagine like that. that, but you know, you know what's funny is I didn't find it to be gratuitous. No, I they they, they do have nudity it's, in the movie. It, they do make a porno in this movie. That is yeah, <laughs> yeah. central action. But it's not, you know, it's very soft core, and like <laughs> in its one hundred and six minute runtime, I would say there is like maybe five minutes of nudity. Right? Am I wrong? I think you're wrong. Yeah, I think there's a lot of nudity. That, maybe not like full blown sex, but a lot of nudity, or at least like a lot of uh, revealing. Like even if they're not nude, when I mean, like, literally full walks blown around. Sex. Full blown like, sex. Think... Yeah, no, but they're nude at every possible chance. Fair enough. And, it, and that is kind of like the arrogance of youth, I guess. I don't know. It's their Pearl sees it as them like flaunting their youth. Mm -hmm. 
and you know they're they're in porn. They are kind of a little, I guess, vain, especially like Jackson, Kid Cudi's character. I, at one point, he says, like, I was born to do this job. Like, he knows. He talks to the old man completely naked. Like, no shame. None of them have any shame. And they kind of know, like, they're young. They're attractive. Bobby Lynn, at one point, says, I'm gorgeous, and that's why they watch me. That's the allure. Like, they all think that they're something. They all think that they're going to be a big star. That's the refrain throughout these, throughout this movie and throughout these characters. And I guess Pearl is kind of that one character that uh, lived the life of that delusion and it was never fulfilled. Bobby Lynn at one point tells her, like, you can't be upset at me just because you wasted your life. They all think that they're going to make it big. You know, they all yeah. think that they are changing the game. And maybe that's not realistic. Maybe Pearl is the most realistic character. Hmm. I like that. I hadn't thought about it like that. He does go on to uh, <laughs> brutally murder people, though, so that's kind of a, a scary thought. Well, that's really realistic. That's true. That's the true. ultimate realism is your dreams will not uh, come to fruition because you are dead. <laughs> <laughs> it's the um, ultimate reality check is being stabbed in the neck. So RJ does give in and he lets Lorraine get filmed because he's pulled aside by this veteran of the industry, Wayne, and is told, Hey man, you got to make it happen. Like get it together. You got to do this. And so he does. And Lorraine films the scene and he is incredibly frustrated and wants to abandon, has the intention of abandoning the crew at the farm. And that's his first mistake, probably, because it's just not a very nice thing to do. But he also runs into Pearl there. And uh, Pearl, weirdly, kind of attempts to, like, have sex with him. I don't know how else to describe it, but she, she, you know, is actively trying to throw herself at him. I think she has, like, an open robe, right? Oh, yeah, and, and she kisses him on the neck. Right, right. And RJ wants nothing to do with it. He's one frustrated, two probably not attracted to this decrepit goblin woman, and he denies her emphatically. <laughs> but then she unfortunately stabs him to death, and he is our first kill of the movie, yeah. fittingly so. And this scene, I think, represents exactly how the characters have been treating her. He goes up to her, and she obviously is kind of holding something behind her back. He goes up to her yeah, uh, and lets her hug him and then kiss his neck. It goes that far because he does not even think for a moment that A, she's capable of sexual deviancy, and B, she's capable of hurting anyone. And that's exactly why he gets killed, is he does not expect it. And Pearl does, like, for the rest of the movie, kind of before she kills these characters or after she kills these characters she really does like fetishize their youth and covet it um there's a very scary scene i guess not because the character's in danger but because she after killing a few characters after killing rj she goes into the guest house covered in blood and naked and just lays in bed with maxine and just starts to caress her kind of rub mm -hmm. her body like she's really covetous of this young beautiful body that she once had um but this scene where rj is killed is horrific like really gore i'll say one of the most like visceral stabbing scenes in a yeah. movie i have seen it's pretty brutal she kills stabs him in the neck He's bleeding to death out of this hole in his neck. Then she he falls over and she gets on top of him uh, in a somewhat sexual position that at least was mirroring what we saw earlier in the film when they were filming the porn. And she takes the knife out and then stabs him repeatedly, 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 and is breathing heavily. And it's very much reminiscent of this uh, porn that we saw earlier. Yeah. And 
by the time she's finished, she like damn near cuts his head off. Like you can see the neck is just open to the world (laughs) and the headlights of the car are covered in blood. She is soaked in blood and it's, uh, it's, it's really visceral. It's really gory. I really enjoyed it though. I mean, I think that in the least weird way possible, um, it's such effective visual storytelling because we see what is probably years upon years of frustration taken out on RJ. And, um, and that shot of the blood on the headlights, oof, yeah, so it, good. It's well acted too. Like, yeah. like you said, the years of aggression, you can like just see it in her. Mm-hmm. in this performance yeah. it's well done yeah i love this scene and great kill too uh and to be able to see this old woman like do the killing makes it more realistic like like i said you wouldn't assume this woman is capable of anything like that until you see her do it and it's like wow she really is um a threat she really is gonna kill people she really is dangerous uh and then that kind of sets up for the rest of the characters who are going to get killed oh they Mm -hmm. actually are in danger they really might get killed uh let's continue talking about the kills they do (laughs) yes they do uh (laughs) lorraine and wayne they become privy to the fact that rj has run off and um they split up going to search for him another really really brutal kill is wayne's when he starts to search for rj in the barn that's not too far from the guest house and we see pearl put a pitchfork through his eyes (laughs) and and there is some of that misjudging this old person right not believing that they are capable of this it doesn't really seem that wayne understands the danger he's in until he is, you know, stabbed in the face. And uh, that's kind of the through line. In fact, the first character that really realizes the threat of these people is probably Lorraine. And and she is also tricked by their perceived innocence, the perceived innocence of these elderly people. But yet yeah, Wayne's kill is also brutal. The Wayne, yeah, so he's completely naked except for some very tight-fitting undergarments and what i hate like really well done shot the camera's like on the ground in front of this board with a nail sticking up and he is on the other side of the barn and he's walking towards the camera towards this board and in your mind you're like no 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 no, (laughs) don't do it and then uh Right there in front of your face, he just stomps down on that nail, and it goes right into his foot, and it's... (laughs) You don't like foot stuff, then huge turn off there. No, that's a a fairly brutal moment. (laughs) But then, like, so many of the other things, like, just completely overshot. But the nail in the foot is pretty grisly. Yeah, and and so he, he hears a noise from outside the barn. He looks through a little peephole. And that's when Pearl sticks a pitchfork through that people and gouges both of his eyes out, I believe. And then you get a shot of his bloodied body on the floor with his eyeball next to him. Uh, And once again, really good gore. The next kill, I believe, is Jackson. Right, Lorraine. Lorraine goes into the house first. Lorraine runs into Howard while she's searching for RJ. And I think she's told, like, Pearl is gone, and he's really worried about her, and he asks Lorraine to go and get a flashlight from their cellar, (laughs) which now I can't stop thinking about the fact that they have a cellar. Um, (laughs) But of course, we all know what happens when you go into a strange man's cellar. You go back up the, the stairs to the door, and you are locked in. And she is able to find a light. This is maybe one of my favorite moments of the movie. Uh, When she finds that light, she also finds kind of like tied to, you know, one of the pillars holding up, uh, I suppose, the ceiling. There is a man 
really sloppily held to that structure. And I think the implication, because basically everything else on his body is bound to the pole or the pillar other than his genitalia. And so I thought the implication was that Pearl was like using him. I'm still unclear on who that person is. Is it, Are we supposed to believe that Pearl has killed before? Yeah. So there's a, the, I like this guy because they don't, go into they don't they don't give him much time but they do some really good visual storytelling to kind of just tell you what has happened so yeah she goes down there and then attached to a wall it with like dungeon shackles is this naked guy um who is blue is a corpse has been there for a while later there's a few lines of dialogue between howard and pearl that imply that they howard has set him up down there to fulfill the needs she has that he no longer can because of his heart problem. And just after this scene is we cut back to the house, and I guess you didn't notice this, but Jackson goes to the fridge and opens it and drinks from a milk carton. And on the side of that milk carton is a missing person with the picture of that body we just saw in the cellar. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, so uh, now you are to believe, like, oh, yeah, they did kidnap this guy uh, a long time ago. He's missing, and they do this every so often. Yeah, there's also the car that's, like, submerged in the pond. Yes, later, yeah, Jackson finds a car dumped in the pond. Um, and I figured that was the guy's car, Yeah, probably right? that but guy's car. Actually, or maybe someone else's. <laughs> maybe another victim, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, very possible. Howard at one point says we can dump the body in the pond with the others. Others, plural. Uh, so this is a recurring thing they do. Yeah, just after Jackson finds that car, that's when he is shot by Howard. Howard kind of tracks him down, and they have an exchange between them. Uh, this is one of the parts that I didn't... For me, it didn't add much. It did feel kind of forced and exposition-y but you know howard and and jackson have that that interaction where they talk about being veterans do you remember howard of world war one and two and jackson of the vietnam war right and uh it is almost tragic in a sense because we know what's going to happen to jackson right Uh, though he is physically superior and and um he could overpower howard fairly easily He's out here in strange territory and doesn't know that uh, Howard has the intention of, of killing him because Jackson, up until this point, doesn't know that anybody is is dead. He doesn't understand the threat of these elderly folks. And, you know, it's also just kind of a lame kill. In my, He's just shot, right? There isn't really anything there. Uh, and, and for me, it took away from the power of Pearl, Right. And what we're watching for, which is like her kind of unleashing this this frustration, I guess it does show us that Howard is complicit in Pearl's behavior. Uh, And and it does give us some depth to that to that relationship, because he's clearly trying to help her get her jollies since he can't do it. But I don't know. Um, I I think it also shows that. While Pearl is jealous of these young women and these young people and their youth, Howard has become jealous of this young man or these young men because they're kind of flaunting their sexuality. He thinks they're seducing his wife. That's what he says just before he shoots Jack. Right. Um, well, and the irony of that, like, you know, to care about that, but then to also go and find her corpses to have yeah, sex feed with. it right into it but also be upset about it yeah right um i mean maybe this is what rj and lorraine could have become in their old age is him hating what she does but still being complicit in it you know for me the veteran dialogue really just more so felt like hey this is the the time period yeah it, it didn't add much to me yeah i, I didn't think it was know that they were both yeah, I think it was just like fleshing the characters out, but not really in a way that helps the story. Right, right. So I understand that complaint. Um, while that's happening, Jackson is dying. <laughs> Pearl 
that's when she starts to caress Maxine's body as Maxine is asleep. You described that scene earlier. And though she doesn't kill her, Pearl doesn't kill Maxine, I agree with you. It's a scary scene. It's very uncomfortable and very sinister. And Maxine's reaction, of course, it only underlines that. She wakes up, sees Pearl, and just screams in horror because, well, <laughs> who would anticipate that happening to you? <laughs> well, just how unsettlingly old she looks. Well, and covered in blood. <laughs> and, and covered in blood. Yeah. Um, it's it's gross, it's scary, and, and very uncomfortable. Um, as Pearl leaves the guest house, Bobby Lynn sees um, the aftermath of this interaction. She, she sees Pearl fleeing. Yeah, and I love this kill. F funnest kill. Maybe not... My favorite one was RJ's, but this one is uh, that classic, like, you gotta have an interesting one in your slasher. For it to yeah. really stand out. And this is that one. Uh, Pearl basically ends up pushing her into the pond. And that humongous alligator <laughs> swims up and chomps her right in the head. Bites her in the head. And then huge, bloody, twisting mess uh, in the water. And fantastic. <laughs> and there's interesting dialogue here, too. I mean, Pearl is very angry at Bobby Lynn and calls her a whore. And um, even though she's, you know, actively jealous of, of these young women throughout the film. And as she said in her um, youth, she used to be a dancer. You know, right. and I assume this is like a burlesque dancer, a cabaret, like a, a promiscuous sort of dancing. At least. Yeah, I need to. I need to watch the sequel because I, I am very curious now. Yeah, me too. Maybe that's uh, something we'll <laughs> talk about soon. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. But, you know, there there's that... She's pushing this woman that she is so obviously jealous of uh, into this lake and, and watching her die with pleasure. And I don't know, there's all sorts of things that you can take away from that. Is she... Is she killing herself is she is she pleased by watching you know the this woman that she would probably really love to be die is it more so that she has more of a fascination with mia goth's character i don't know there, there's a lot of things that you can take from this kill and, and the dialogue between them and i'm into it just after this now we're only down to maxine and Lorraine, who, don't forget, is still locked into the house. There is, or excuse me, in the house. There is a really brutal, brutal shot of uh, Lorraine. She tries to use this hatchet that she finds in the basement to get through the door. And Howard, of course, is now back in the house. And he sees her trying to do this. And just like destroys her hand <laughs> forcing Lorraine back inside. And now she's of course lost the hatchet. What I don't remember, cause I watched it early in the week. What did he break her hand with? I wasn't quite sure what it was, but I think it was either another hatchet or like a kitchen knife. Yeah. I mean, but it's so gross. We get this shot of Lorraine bleeding profusely from her hand and screaming her lungs out. Uh, and I just, I just loved it. I thought it was so visceral and so effective. She is, she is screwed. We definitely think she's going to die at this point. <laughs> uh, it feels very hopeless, the situation that these folks are in. And yet for me, there was never any doubt that Maxine was going to make it out, even before I knew that there was a third movie planned with her in the leading role. Yeah, she's the final girl. She yeah. w at least was the main character. The movie kind of focused on her more than the others. But this movie's so subversive, it's one of those that, like, maybe they would kill the main character. But Exactly. For me, I never had a doubt. I, I pretty much was gathering <laughs> where this was going to go. So Maxine is making her way around the compound, we'll call it, the farm. 
and she sees that Pearl and Howard are now going back together to the guest house, which is where they were staying, Maxine and company. And she hides under a bed, hoping that, well, I don't know, I guess hoping that they'll go away and maybe she can make her escape. But they start to talk about killing these people, Pearl and Howard do. And <laughs> another really disturbing scene in the movie. I'll let you describe it if you'd like. Okay, uh, well, we don't know Maxine's hiding under the bed. We just see Howard and Pearl talking, and then Pearl finally convinces him, uh, screw it, let's have sex. And so they start having sex. Uh, the camera pans down to under the bed, and there's Maxine, uh, horrified. And she manages to crawl out of the room while they're distracted and run back to the main house, where she frees Lorraine from the basement. Uh, Lorraine panics and is screaming and tries to run out the door. And right as she leaves the threshold of the doorway, boom, her face is blown off with a shotgun instantaneously. Maxine knows to hide. She doesn't scream a lot of times when others might have. And so she's kind of... The one in the survival mindset, I guess. She's the smartest one in the slasher setting. And she hides behind a wall. She pulls out this gun that was supposedly in the... Uh, this gun that was in their vehicle the whole time. That Wayne owned. It was supposedly to just, like, wave around and scare people if he needed to use it. And it's... This is another subversive thing about this movie is this gun is introduced in the first act. It's very traditionally, literally Chekhov's gun. So here we yeah. are in the final act. The gun's about to be used and she goes to fire it and the bullets are empty. It's there for show. It was never actually loaded. <laughs> so now she's in a tough situation. I completely neglected. As they're dragging Lorraine's body back into the house, she like gurgles. And that makes Howard jump, and that is enough. Chekhov's real gun was actually Chekhov's heart murmur. And Howard is spooked by uh, this body moving, and he has a heart attack and dies right there. Did you also laugh out loud at that part? N maybe not out loud, but I did. I was like, ah, oh, fine, there it is. <laughs> it was bound oh, to happen. so funny. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought maybe he was going to die while they were having sex. Because there is, like, a... I'm talking two minutes of, like old person missionary being filmed i didn't know if they were going to do it then but yeah he lorraine's dying body is enough and it made it made me laugh i did also just to go back to what you were talking about earlier the pistol reveal was so brutal you know like her having that getting it out of the van it, and then just knowing that it was all a facade watching that like crumble i thought that was such an, a, a great scene i really i really like mia goth in this role or i guess in these roles and yeah so she is suddenly not got the upper hand pearl grabs howard's shotgun and tries to blast her and this was kind of funny i guess this was kind of funny i guess yeah yeah <laughs> she misses and is like <laughs> thrown out the door because she's uh 90 pound woman holding a blunderbuss and the knockback throws her out of the door and i think she finally does break a hip and can't get back up and now she is incapacitated in her own zeal to kill maxine she is crippled herself so then maxine goes to get the keys to their truck howard and pearl's truck she gets in and is about to drive away, but uh, a still alive Pearl is yelling profanities at her, telling her she'll never be a star. Um, so instead of driving away, she puts that <laughs> she puts that truck in reverse, and uh, just crushes her head, <laughs> crushes Pearl's head in a it's awesome. very visceral like watermelon exploding <laughs> head crush, and then she drives off. And I like that. Um, I do too. Then the ending harkens back. The, the movie actually begins with the 
uh, cops investigating the aftermath of what happened, and then we get the flashback to the events of this movie. So at the end of the movie, we are back to the cops, back to the sheriff looking around, and this is a nice bit of, I guess, another subtle bit of subversion. So many horror movies do this, where, like, the cops are looking at the carnage, figuring out what happened, and then some great, maybe profound final words are said by the cops at the end of the movie. Here, uh, <laughs> one of the investigating cops looks at the sheriff and says, what do you think happened, sheriff? And the sheriff looks at him, and he goes, how the hell am I supposed to know? <laughs> they have no idea what went on. They don't have a clue. They just know there's bodies everywhere. Um, they find the camera, and uh, the same guy says, what do you think's on it, sheriff? And he says, probably the most disturbing horror movie ever made. <laughs> They'll be surprised. There's also the reveal that Maxine is uh, from a conservative Christian household specifically. The, the, there's a few instances where we hear this preacher, uh, this like televangelist sort of character on the TV. Uh, I believe it's playing at the gas station they go to in the beginning of the movie, but it's also playing on Pearl and Howard's TV towards the end. Yeah, she parrots stuff he says. She, she says... um what is the line? I am going to live the life I deserve, I think is what she keeps saying. And this is something the televangelist keeps saying. And you're not quite sure why at first, but it's this thing she says to herself in the mirror. This is something that like is a refrain in her life, and you're not quite sure why until the end of the movie, we see the televangelist on screen, and he says, and he's ranting on about sin or whatever, and he says, let me show you my the cross I have to bear and he reveals a picture of his daughter Maxine it's a picture of Maxine and he says she's been taken by the devil into the hands of devils and is corrupted into sin and now you kind of understand why she's been saying uh, that, that is why she has this kind of warped sense of self which what a wild thing to do yeah by the way I <laughs> For the, I mean it's a televangelist that. he's That's gonna true. be doing some wild things I mean, but even Joel Osteen, I don't think would. Okay, well, Joel Osteen's like rich. This is like a, you're in, you know, it's one of them Fire churches. Brimstone. Yeah, it's one of them churches that's like in a mobile unit, and they're like <laughs> rubbing snakes, and shit, you know. <laughs> it's like one of those kind of televangelists. Yeah, yeah. So I get it. I get. I, I understand the pageantry, but um. Yeah, and, and that detail maybe would have been too much if I didn't know there was another movie coming. That that definitely plays a role in Maxine's development, and the fact that she's getting a whole other movie is going to make yeah, that make more sense, probably. It's called uh, Maxine with three capital X's in the middle. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> excited keeping for the, that. the naming scheme, I suppose. Yeah, I'm excited for that. Me too. And I really, now I really want to watch Pearl. I do too. But yeah, I uh, I like this movie. Again, I wish I had maybe known a little bit less about it before watching it. I wish I had talked to less people about it, or rather, I wish less people had talked to me about it. But this is a good watch, and it is really unique. Uh, there isn't quite anything like it out there right now. You know, shout out to Ty West. It's a It's a really unique movie. Yeah, this is... And, and once again, I really like the idea of running with these characters and kind of making a series of films that are related, but aren't, it's not so much a franchise so much as it is these characters, if that makes sense. And I like that. I do appreciate that. I really want to watch Pearl. The film series is called the Pearl film series, or at least is like mm. being called that by the fans, but right. I really enjoyed it. Good to see... A slasher, like I, I hadn't seen a slasher in a while, and I was really feeling it. I was, I needed that bloodlust, and so it was good to get a slasher. But it was also not just the typical formula so much. You know, I was a little surprised by this movie at certain times, and I enjoyed that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. It's a good watch. It's also not mindless, and I love a mindless slasher, but I like this kind of thing too. Yeah, and I'm, let's watch Pearl now. <laughs> Yeah, I'm down. Let's do okay. it. Okay. Well, thank you for joining me, Adrian. Thank you for <laughs> being a friend.
<laughs> <laughs> of course, of course, you too. Uh, thank everybody for listening. Goodbye.